his name was Daphne. I'm going to get a cross for you there. Yeah. Really lovely to have you here at our fifth Wales wow Summit. Uh, this is uh, day two uh, of the of the full summit. I hope some of you've been able to join uh, some of the sessions yesterday, um, and there's many more to come. Um, my name is Annabelle Burgess. I'm one of the newest members uh, of the Board of Trustees uh, at Wow, and it is my absolute pleasure to uh, open today's event. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into things. Um, WOW is a registered charitable trust. It is a for-purpose, not-for-profit organisation run by a dedicated group of individuals, many of whom are in the room today, are volunteers, other board members, um, so please feel free to uh, say hello, uh, thank our volunteers at the door um, and have a chat. They are equally as passionate as all of you. Um, and I would also like to thank all of our pollination partners. Uh, we have Lake Wanaka Tourism, Destination Queenstown, Freshlink, Central Lakes Trust, amongst uh, many others. But the big uh, pakipaki for today is Greenhawk, our local uh, accounting firm. So um, I'm not sure if the team is in the room. I'm trying to see. There we go. We've got a couple. So please, um, yeah, a big thank you over there. Um, and... What are the other housekeeping? I've got my list here. Emergency exits. Um, this store here, Penny, can you nod and make sure that I'm saying the right things? Yeah, beautiful. Um, and we can go out the front as well. Um, the meeting point is out uh, the Masonic Lodge, if people know where that is. Um, can I get some nods? People are happy to go. Great, awesome. Um, and location of the toilets, we're out the back. Um, there'll be signs and people that can direct you if anyone needs to go that way and what we are all here for today. Uh, a topic very dear to my heart, and I'm sure many of you in the room as well. Uh, seafood, uh, oceans, uh, sustainability of both of those. Um, I would like to introduce our presenter, Veronica. Um, I first met Veronica when she came into our shared working space and I instantly uh, was exposed to her energy and passion for uh, the environment and the oceans. So I'm very excited uh, for her to bring her science background uh, and experience to all of us in the room uh, today. So over to you, Ronnie. Uh, I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Kia ora, everyone. Um, ko Veronica Toku Ingoa no Aratana Ho. Ko Remarkable Soku Manga, Ko Arate Awa, Ko Aotearoa Te Iwi, Ko Nasi Hoa Te Whanau, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. So, my name is Veronica Rotman. I'm a marine scientist uh, from over the hill in Aratown, and I work up in the far north in Kaitaia um, as a tertiary educator. Uh, with reps of the Murafinua up there teaching tertiary aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, um, to my array of students. So I've got a bit of a background in microplastics, research, aquaculture and conservation. Um, but yeah, here to talk about Kaimuana today. So hopefully you guys take a thing or two away and um, yeah, come out of it feeling fizzed about the ocean. Now, if you would like to ask any questions throughout uh, this lecture, please jump on to www.menti.com and enter in this code. Feel free to take a photo of it quickly now um, if you would like to get those questions out while they are fresh in your mind, um, and they will be answered right at the end. So. Go for gold. I'll see how I can do. Um, cool. If you guys got that. So, kicking things off with this lovely photograph um, taken in New Zealand. Now we do have such an incredibly unique marine environment in Aotearoa, from the manta rays in the subtropical waters of Northland, and the odd whale shark that we've been seeing recently. Uh, to our huiho and our sea lions down in the south coast. Those freezing cold subantarctic currents come whipping through. 
We have half of the world's cetaceans in New Zealand, including the critically endangered Maui dolphins, 1,400 fish species, and heaps of funky stuff. <coughs> How many people in this room would you say have seen the film Sea Spiracy? Yeah, a few of you? Yeah, a fair few. Now, it was a film that created great polarisation between those who watched it. It was highly dramatic, um, but it did have some positives at the end of the day. Whether you like it or not, there are some bold claims, and these claims have varying degrees of truth to them, um, certainly in the context of Aotearoa. So I have been asked to investigate the validity of the uh, claims in the film Seaspiracy and address them in a New Zealand context. So scientists were particularly skillfully ignored in um, the Seaspiracy film. It really successfully created an environment of distrust against, against not only scientists but also NGOs that are really trying their best to do some good work um, and the government as well. One of my biggest issues with it was its lack of considering indigenous viewpoints throughout the film. Really um, didn't do too well with that. However, it did also start a conversation about the ocean, um, expose some very real issues that are happening in the world, including, uh, but not limited to, bycatch, industrial overfishing, slavery, and illegal fishing. And um, whether you like it or not, really, it did result in less people eating fish. Less demand equals less supply, but we'll touch on that later on, because I certainly love seafood. <laughs> so the first claim that I'm going to address is that in the film they said that there will be an empty ocean by 2048, to the quote that it would be so depleted that stocks would yield less than 10% of their historically highest catches. Now, this claim was made in a scientific paper back in 2006 by a guy named Boris Worm. Now, the beauty of the scientific process is that other scientists have to go through and rigorously um, peer review your work. Um, and if it's not up to scratch, then it basically gets chucked out the back door. So this paper was retracted. And not too long ago, I was unsure why they included that quote in the film. The reality is that 34.2% of our global fish stocks are overexploited at a global scenario. So it isn't good, but it's not as bad as claimed in the film. And the good news is that thousands of these fish populations that have considered to have collapsed actually can recover with the right management. It's just that management coming to be, which can be slightly difficult. Now, it may be empty of some stocks if we do not improve management, and the Atlantic bluefin and southern bluefin come to mind um, here. They're not in such a fabulous state. Now, in a New Zealand context, um, really depends who you talk to as to uh, what the state of our fisheries is at. There is a huge lack of trust and clear vision between stakeholders. And there's, a, there's just a history of very poor relationships between scientists and industry to the point that um, the opinions are so polarizing that collaboration hasn't really happened so well, which is a real shame. Um, I'm going to just talk about a few examples of the not so well managed uh, stocks in New Zealand, but do know that there are some that are actually in really quite good states, uh, which is great. It is very uh, dependent on the area though as well. You do think that, oh, the ocean is all one, they all swim um, vast dis distances in which some of them do, but um, it really depends on the region as to what the uh, stock is at. So Tirikihi is the first example, a very popular New Zealand fish. Um, yeah, it's delicious, and 90% of what is caught is actually sold in New Zealand. So it's a very popular domestic fish. However, the East Coast fisheries are in bloody big trouble. So um, 
the first full stock assessment of Terekihi occurred in the fishing season of 17 and 18. And um, kind of basically what they found is that the stock is below the level of biomass in which very quick action should occur to be able to save the stock. So that threshold level of biomass is 20% of unfished levels. So what that means is 100% would be, is, would be prior to industrial fishing or it would be if we stopped fishing the stock and let it go back to those levels. So that would be 100%. So it was below 20%, it was about 15.9%, which is really not good at all. So what happened is that they put in a 25% uh, reduction in how much fish could be taken, and they estimate that that will take about 25 years for the stocks to recover, which is quite long. Wouldn't go buying terekihi from the supermarket. Um, now, another example is our kura, or our rock lobster. Um, in some populations, like down in the southwest coast, over in Haas area, it's like bloody crayfish supermarket. It's um, quite incredible when you put your face underneath the water and look in some cracks and just see like 40 crayfish. It's amazing. Um, however, this is not everywhere again. So back in 2016, the quarter were deemed functionally extinct in the Hodaki Gulf. Um, what that means is not that there are none there, it means that there is simply not enough for them to actually um, provide ecosystem value. Um, so in the form of chomping on kinna, keeping their kinna populations under control, hence we have such bad issue with kinna barrens up in the Hodaki Gulf, hence no kelp forests, um, hence quite a um, dire environment there. Um, What's really interesting about this, although it's such an issue, is that you can still take quarter in the Hodaki Gulf. You can still take three rock lobsters and three pack horses a day. Um, and the commercial catch still occurs, even though they estimate that their numbers are between 3 and 12% of unfished levels. So they are well below that threshold at which very quick action should occur to stop them from being wiped out. Now, something that people don't seem to appreciate about crayfish is that they take six or seven years to reach sexual maturity, okay? So that's when they can start pumping out babies. Um, and it actually takes them eight years to reach legal size. So I think once you kind of get your head around that, there's a little bit more appreciation when you are um, either getting them from the ocean or enjoying them yourselves. And I've just put this graph up on the side here, um, table, to show how measly the fines and the uh, consequences are for taking too many, too much kaimuana in New Zealand. It's uh, a little bit pathetic, to be honest. And the numbers are also reducing in uh, marine reserves as well because crayfish move seasonally and um, a lot of people just will hang out right on the edge of that marine reserve uh, to get a feed. Now, another example is the scallop scenario in New Zealand. So, God, they're delicious, but they're really not in such a good way. Um, Niwa did a, a survey recently and they found that there's been a 93% reduction around the Hodaki Gulf area. Um, hence, those large-scale closures of the scallop beds, apart from two, one being right beside Little Barrier Island, which is peculiar. Um, scallops are fast growing, but they do also have quite a high mortality rate. Um, it doesn't help that they're picked up by dredges at a commercial scale, and dredges, as we know, will go through and uh, churn up everything and uh, take what is whatever is on the bottom there. So it's not great. The huge issue with sedimentation that we're seeing uh, globally coming out of rivers and smothering environments is also contributing to that quite badly. Uh, the thing is, that is, those three uh, examples are definitely not great, but they can all be reversed. 
it's really not such a terrible scenario as one may think. We could simply reduce quota of these species or give them a breather altogether. Increase the marine protected areas around our country um, and actually focus them on being in coastal areas instead of 100,000 kilometres offshore on the Kermadex. Um, demand transparency with where our Kaimoana comes from and how it's actually sourced. And apply an ecosystem-based management approach which is looks at um, addressing the ecosystem as a whole and society as well. So it's more of a holistic way of looking at the ocean instead of just simply looking at a fish stock by fish stock. Oh, I could use this. Um, now this here is a summary of catch allocation. So it's how quota is deemed in New Zealand. So this is how numbers are estimated. So you've got the total fish stock of a species, let's say blue cod, and this is determined through stock assessments. So you could look at catch per unit effort from commercial fisheries, um, you can do trawl surveys, you can do all sorts of different ways to estimate how many fish are in the ocean or in a region. Now, um, you from there, there is a total allowable catch which is calculated, and this is broken up into the commercial catch and the allowance for recreational and customary fishing. And then the commercial catch is broken up into individual transferable quotas. So we'll talk about those quotas in a little while, but we are informed, as in we have some idea of the stock numbers the population age distribution, ages of sexual maturity, um, how often they're reproducing, things like that. We are informed on some of those really basic um, kind of data points on around 160 fish stocks. So that makes up 69% of the commercial catch in Aotearoa. Now, what that means is fabulous, we're informed on some fish, that's good, but it means that we are not informed on 31% of the commercial catch. Almost a third of the fish that we take out of the ocean, those stocks, we've got no idea, not a clue how those numbers are doing. Um, 228 fish stocks. We cannot make a judgment on sustainability. Um, and there are a few reasons for this, mainly due to the really, really high cost of being able to go out and do those surveys because you are on the water you're using expensive techniques. There's eco, acoustic sounders, all sorts. But if Kiwis value our oceans and our fish so much, surely we'd place a little more value in making sure that this science is available. So what this means is that inevitably there's many, many decisions that are made without um, a proper base of evidence. And this is from the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor report back in 2019, looking at the target levels of stocks. So of those important stocks, you'll see at the top, the 69% that we do have some idea about you can see that around 30% of them are very unlikely to be at or above target levels. Um, another kind of 20% is about as likely as not. So you could probably read between the lines there. Um, and then around half of it is likely, very likely, or virtually certain to be at or above target levels. Um, of course, that 31% we simply do not know about. I'll just bring your attention to the right side as well, the time since last assessment. This is important because it's not like for every one of these stocks an assessment is done each year. Some of them are over 10 years ago. So a lot can change in that time. So even if we're informed on something, it could not be uh, quite so valid nowadays. 
Another claim made by the film is that the ocean's floor is being destroyed. And this is by means of bottom trawling and dredging. I mean, they're not wrong here. Um, it is. And not only is it a non-selective fishing method, but it also releases as much carbon into the ocean as the entire aviation industry. Paper just came out a year or two ago. So that trauma stirs up all of the carbon that has sunken down and been stored in the ocean floor, releases it, adding to our ocean acidification issue. In a New Zealand context, it's not that great. So this is a quote by MPI in the 2021 <coughs> fishing year, almost 250,000 tonnes or 68% of the volume of all fish caught commercially in New Zealand were caught with trawling gear within one metre of the seabed. So the reason why I show this is because you guys can all have a role to play here. So many common fish species that we buy from the supermarket is caught via bottom trawl. So this gives you all a bit of responsibility to take care and asking, how is your fish caught? At the supermarket, at the um, fish and chip shops, at your restaurants? How is it caught? Is it caught by bottom trawl or dredging? Then perhaps that's a no. Um, Terekihi, you've got gurnard, hokey, snapper, all very commonly caught via bottom trawl. They can be caught by other methods as well, but a lot of the time caught by a bottom trawl. The issue with this is that even decades after bottom trawling subsides, there is very little um, rejuvenation of the benthic community. So, the, and a good example is the Hauraki Gulf. So the Hauraki Gulf used to be very clean, blue, um, beautiful visibility because it was covered in green shell mussel beds. And they used to chomp to purify the ocean, stabilizing that sediment. Then, back in the 70s, they were dredged up. Um, and prior to the time that they were dredged, the gulf supported 10 times more small fish and four times more invertebrates. And the thing is, with bottom trawling, is that there are better ways. So you can use sunken long lines, sunken hooks. Um, it's absolutely bonkers that it's not a legality with scallop, commercial scallop taking to use breathing apparatuses. So go down on scuba. Um, it's just dredge at the moment, which is crazy. Um, and there's some actually very cool innovation going on um, in the particularly inshore fishing community, looking at different trawl methods that don't have such an impact on the environment. So I want to provide a bit of a balanced argument as well in say that it's also important to know, although this is not good, um, that we do have lower socioeconomic communities that do still rely on fish or do want to eat it to some degree. And so the thing that trawling does provide is large quantities at a smaller price tag. And in terms of lower cost, cost products, it does mean that some of these fish are more accessible to everyone. So it's important to look at things kind of all different ways. Now, another claim, which is very interesting in the film, is that aquaculture is the devil. Now, it kind of made this, uh, gave the idea that global aquaculture was dominated by um, predatory, uh, a large fish like tuna and things, which just isn't the case. Really, shellfish, seaweed, and freshwater fish make up the large majority of uh, global aquaculture, and a, l a huge amount of this is done in third world countries. So, to put it in context, 70% of the world is water, right? 30% land, but 98% of the food we create comes from that, from that 2% of land. So, it's a huge unlocked potential here. It just has to be done in the right ways. Um, over half of the seafood we eat now uh, comes from aquaculture, believe it or not. Um, and when it's done well, it's awesome. 
Um, as long as you're controlling the impact that you have on the environment there, it provides jobs, especially in poor island nations. Um, and yeah, it can support whole small regional communities. So in a New Zealand context, um, we don't use antibiotics, steroids, and we don't have any issues with sea lice with our salmon. Most farms are in sensible places with adequate water flow. However, we're seeing huge issues with this now in the Marlborough Sounds because it's getting too hot. Climate change is, especially in those um, fairly warm areas of the Marlborough Sounds, it's just heating up the water too much that it's on the upside of the salmon's tolerance level and it, they are dying. So this, this point perhaps is no longer valid. They're trying to create, uh, they're trying to get the permission to be able to move offshore um, and into the Cook Strait there where there's heaps of water flow. So you're not gonna see those environmental issues and it's a little bit cooler, but it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on in some ways because it's just gonna keep getting warmer. So they'll probably have to move stocks south um, which yeah the cool thing is is that the majority of our industry is actually green shell mussels and these guys are awesome they munch to purify the ocean they will stabilize suspended sediment um, remove nitrogen and they're just extremely healthy for you they're also so so cheap um, so I'd say that's probably the most sustainable seafood that you can eat is mussels um, farm raised. Now, another cool <coughs> thing is that the feed conversion rate of fish in aquaculture is continually improving with science. So you've got chickens, like two to three kilos of feed makes one kilo of chicken. Beef is between six and 10. Um, pork's around five or so. And uh, salmon's around one point, I think it's between like 1.2 and 1.6 kilos of feed to make one kilo of salmon, which, you know, there's still room for improvement there, but it is um, not so bad. There's also so many cool things that's happening in the innovative space. So we've just created this whole seaweed plan for seaweed aquaculture in Aotearoa, not only for chomping and consuming the seaweed, but um, extracting really valuable pharmaceutical and nutraceutical uh, products. And there's some cool work going on with RAS systems, recirculating aquaculture, which is using tanks so that you're not impacting the outside environment, it's land-based. And they're doing some really cool work up in Northland with kingfish and it's bloody delicious as well. So you'll start to see that coming up more and more at um, restaurants, especially the Northland Kingfish. Another claim was that we catch obscene amounts of bycatch. Now, bycatch becomes obscene if it is not utilized, and this is termed discard, okay? So the reality is, is that discard rates are about 10.8% globally which is disgusting, considering the number of people that are dealing with food insecurity. Um, there's nothing that can really allow that. However, they do in the film clay that claim that this is around 40%, which is um, inaccurate. So just to really, um, yeah, and this occurs due to size restrictions. It occurs due to the value of the species. Um, and the quality of catch as well. That's why people will discard. They will want a higher quality or a catch that perhaps provides them more money. Now, to really drive this point home, if you could just close your eyes just for one moment and imagine that the sun's setting off Great Barrier Island. You're on a kayak and it's just it's beautiful. It's calm. It's beautiful viz and you're fishing and you Oh, there's a pull on the line. What's this? You're on the lookout for snapper. Oh, this feels a bit heavier than snapper. Now, you've caught a kingfish. You can open your eyes now. And you've caught a kingfish, but really you wanted snapper. So what are you going to do? You're going to, um, it's a really good-sized kingfish, bearing in mind. Um, 
are you going to throw that kingfish back or just kill it and then not use it? You're going to feed your family for a week with that kingfish. Um, same being as if you caught a trevally or a, a whatever. Um, it's not necessarily going to be discarded just because it's bycatch. And in New Zealand, um, fish managed under the quota management system actually must be landed and declared and sold. Not that this is always abided by, but that is the whole purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a huge issue with bycatch in New Zealand. We do. Dolphins, sea lions, seabird, very, very real issue. Um, and much of which is dead upon recovery. And there are also some issues with observer coverage in terms of actually estimating the numbers of these species that are being caught as bycatch. Historically, we've got a terrible um, track record with the percentage of observer coverage. So back in 2009 and 10, only less than 2% of trawl toes were observed in inshore fisheries. So that's in areas where the Maui dolphins were found as well. So that's an issue. We need more observers out on boats. There is some cool stuff going on with getting cameras on boats. Um, but it's very slowly, slowly happening. Now, it's not like the fishing industry is doing nothing. They don't want to be catching seabirds and dolphins and things. It's not, that's not nice at all. Some of the commercial fishermen are the nicest, most passionate about the ocean that you'll, you'll meet. It's, um, it's not fair to say, you know, that they, they are not, um, they're not necessarily reporting it because they don't care. Sometimes it's because they'll lose their livelihoods and they'll lose their families' livelihoods. So it's a, it's a very real issue, but there are some incredible people working on it. So you've got innovations like the sled there at the bottom, the sea lion exclusion device, which allows sea lions to swim out um, in arrow squid trawls in the subantarctics. Um, you've got my mate Tane's project working in uh, drones, artificial intelligent drones, looking to track where Maui dolphins are along our west coast and then protecting those areas in which they most reside. It's very, very cool. Um, and realistically, we're never going to be able to only catch a target, capture target species, but we can improve those odds. Another claim is that dolphin safe certifications, MSC certifications mean nothing. That's not quite true. So these are carried out almost always by third party auditors um, and they have publicly available sustainability criteria which they uh, utilise for this. Um, it's not an easy process and some fisheries and stocks work for decades to achieve these um, certifications. There are some issues with it, especially MSC, which have a few orange roughy stocks um, that are certified, which still haven't recovered since they were overfished back decades ago. There used to be the best, uh, the forest and bird best fish guide, which has and that's in the middle there, that's no longer continued due to lack of funding. But with the NGO approach, it can be on quite the extreme end of the, the spectrum as well. Um, overall, anything that says that the pole and line court is best, um, even long line court. There's a Monterey Bay Aquarium website is good to refer to for fish species as well. Um, and the legitimacy of all these kind of certification areas really depends. There's not one that exists that's uh, specific to New Zealand. And so we've kind of been in the talks for a while to look at trying to make one, but it's very difficult politically. Um, it shouldn't be though. We shouldn't be ashamed of the way that we catch fish. Um, so we really need to kind of think about that. The resource is desperately needed and Crown Research Institutes won't go near it because it's too closely tied uh, to the government, which is what it is. Something that's really interesting that 
they do require in the EU is labelling on their seafood products. So it is a legality to have not only the species and the region, but the fishing method used to catch the fish. Now, I'm sure if you guys went to the supermarket and saw um, long line versus bottom trawl, it would be quite an easy decision as to which fish you went for. So my question is, why is this not a legality in New Zealand? And how can we go about achieving this? So my friend Rosa and I, who works at Inshore Fisheries, we're looking at trying to work with the industry to encourage them to utilise labelling and try and get the labelling up in supermarkets. Some of them are super keen. They're like, oh, it's the supermarkets that aren't keen for us to do this. So it's a really interesting project. And if we can achieve it, then hopefully you guys can make some nice, clear um, shopping decisions. Another claim is that fisheries is responsible for everything wrong in the ocean. That's just simply not the case. Um, you can't talk about the ocean without talking about climate change, ac acid acidification, to a smaller degree, plastic pollution, um, which is one of their points in the film. They kind of said that the majority of plastic that enters the ocean comes from the ocean, from fisheries. That's just not true. In some areas it is. Um, plastic fishing nets and buoys are easier to count than tiny little microfibers. Um, that is sinking down into the depths. So for some regions, of course, they're going to find more fishing gear. Um, you should still care about all the other stuff quite um, a lot, including the plastic issue, which we found was mostly coming from our clothing, from microfibers. So I looked at the guts of fish around New Zealand and found that a bunch of what was in their tummy was microfibers from our clothes coming out of washing machines. So what you can do is wash less cold and full, buy natural materials like cotton and linen, beautiful. Don't use the dryer, you can purchase filtering apparatuses and always be the device you can hand anyway. Now, this, these are the really important claims and the first one that really drives home is that they say that sustainable fishing cannot exist and this is simply not true because it must exist. It absolutely does exist. A basic definition is taking the right quantity year on year in perpetuity. And we have a whole branch of science, mathematics, computer mod models to um, sort this out. So when a stop is sustainably managed, everyone does better, including the fishermen, the communities, um, the locals that are fishing themselves. There's no conspiracy here. Everyone wants the ocean to be managed well. And a huge issue with the film is the emission of small-scale artisanal fisheries, much of which still exists in New Zealand. So globally, a third of what we eat actually comes from those small-scale local and artisanal fisheries, and then two-thirds from the big old huge commercial uh, big nets and things. Um, and something that's sad is that in most countries, these small-scale commercial entities often fall victim to the large scale through quota accessibility and things. And I'll kind of touch on that because around 15 years after the quota management system uh, was established, over 3,000 predominantly small scale fishers exited the industry. And this was very regionally based. Um, so it was spread throughout New Zealand and thus small scale, they, they're using more sustainable fishing methods um, and they're selling not so much. And they exit it due to compliant costs, uncertainty about future policies um, and the high cost of quota. So this is where things really went south. What happened is that the larger companies brought up the quota of these small scale companies. So we now have around 10 big entities that own around 76 or so percent of quota, which is an issue. Um, and what that meant is instead of being regionally distributed, that um, fishing effort and emphasis was moved to larger ports, to cities. So it took 
the economic benefit away from those smaller communities and those family-based fisheries. Now, <laughs> this is the most crazy claim of them all, is to stop eating fish. The world is not going to stop eating fish, and it is not possible to do so. Um, and to suggest so is a little naive. We've got three billion people in the world that rely on fish as their primary source of protein, okay? Um, and to not make that distinction is really quite odd, um, considering that a lot of these people fall under BIPOC and the world's poorest as well. Yes, the film targeted um, privileged people like us in this room, um, who have the luxury of choice. Um, but they really should have worked harder at making that distinction. And in order for this large proportion of the population to be able to actually survive, we've, we've, got, we've got no choice. We must invest in sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. And to not mention that there are really well-managed stocks around the world is also a little bizarre. It's up to you guys really to do your own research to some degree and get educated on what you feel comfortable um, spending your money on. Uh, but even just going and asking where your fish has come from and how it is caught is a fabulous place to start. In a New Zealand context, I think about my students in the far north um, and saying this, if you are in the fortunate position not to rely solely on the ocean for sustenance, like some of these guys are up north, consider reducing your commercial fish or your commercial seafood consumption in favour of other objects. It's not about not eating fish, it's about appreciating it. It's about eating it like a treat and actually really appreciating it, appreciating every bite. Now, there's a few species which are going to be better to purchase than others. Um, farmed mussels, power, salmon, kingfish, great options, wild cockles, albacore and skipjack tuna, uh, kahawai, beautiful, mullet, trevally, pilchards-ish, popcorn, blue cod and kingfish, really great options. Um, and there's a bunch that you really don't want to kind of go to and that is your bluefin and yellowfin tuna, tirakihi, orange ruffy, bottom trawl hoki, um, Jack mackerel, depending on how it was caught. Um, anything really that's bottom trawl, you ideally don't want to be buying. And some of these can be caught via other means as well. So how do we choose good fish? This is the happy part of it. Is we buy Aotearoas. So don't, I just would not purchase any seafood from overseas if I could avoid it because you cannot ensure traceability, can't ensure that that fish wasn't caught using slavery. Um, if you're buying from New Zealand, you're reducing emissions associated with transporting it halfway across the world. Um, you're ensuring that human rights are being fulfilled and you know that they're not using crazy gnarly nuts chemicals, um, especially in aquaculture. So if you can buy direct from small scale fisheries that own their own quota, that's a great way to do it because with the quota, as I said, um, there are kind of 10 or so large entities that own the majority of the quota. And then what they'll do is they'll lease it out to smaller scale uh, fisheries. But with that, they lease it out to them and they will have to sell the fish back to that large scale enterprise at the price that they determine. So you're not getting very high margins on that lease quota, which means they often can't invest and better sustainability practices. So if you can buy direct from the fisherman that owns the quota, that's awesome because um, you're just supporting it a little better. Um, and catch to order, there are some awesome new seafood enterprises, uh, Nadic Gravity, there's uh, Tora, there's Yellow Brick Road who are doing catch to order and they're selling fish whole, encouraging them to utilize the um, the entire fish instead of just using 35% of it, which is what Kiwis generally do. Um, and I'm on a huge learning process 
um, learning how to smoke things and create fish stocks, turning that into soups and pies, um, and get Googling. Like, there's so much that you can do. Now, a few of the more sustainable fishing methods that we can kind of talk about is pole and line and pots. A lot of blue cod is caught via pots, which is really good because it can be released live if it's um, a little small. They're always going to be best. Long line is great if there is the use of the Tory lines that you can see here, which help to prevent uh, seabird bycatch, which is a real issue. It scares them away a little. And sunken hooks as well. Weighting the hooks makes it go down quicker, so you're less likely to get more bycatch. Um, snappers used a lot in long line leaf fish that you can get at the supermarket, I believe. That's caught via long line. Can also have bad effects as well, um, but you've kind of got to balance things out and realise that nothing's going to be perfect, but you do your best. Per sign, as long as there's no use of fads or fish aggregation devices, they can be okay. You can get minimal bycatch, um, but they can also not be amazing as well. So it's hard because you can't say that something's a golden ticket. There's really um, positives and negatives. Midwater trawl can be okay as well. Yes, it's a trawl, but it doesn't have that impact on the seabed. Um, frozen fish, not terrible, turns out. Um, if you They freeze them at the most highest point of nutritional quality, and it actually preserves the flavour really well and the nutrients. It prevents wastage, um, especially with seasonal variations with the fish. Now, of course, hunter-gathering is going to be the best way that you can possibly get your seafood, right? Is the most selected. It means you're invested in the catch. You can be respectful, especially if you're spearfishing. You can see it underwater. Um, and because you've put this effort in to retrieve this fish and then put the time in to process it, then you're really going to honour the animal and make the most of cooking it and making something really, really delicious. But don't take the piss. So there's a legality that you can take, I think about 10 snapper a day in the Hodaki Gulf. And if you've got a boat full of five, that's 50 snapper, that's out the gate. You just do not need that many fish. Um, in terms of Wanaka, I had an awesome conversation with a guy, Johnny, at CDU, and he's just a legend. And he talked to me about the combination of quota, some of its own, some of its lease, where he gets his fish from, a lot from the West Coast. And he said, look, not all of it's great, but here are some that you should go for. And that is blue cod, pot caught, spam salmon. Um, and if you're looking at sporting smaller independents, potting cod, gurnard and sole. If you're at the supermarket, leaf fish and also farmed um, mussels and cockles as well. Amazing. It's such a privilege to enjoy our Kaimoana in New Zealand. Um, please respect our oceans by considering to collect it um, sparingly and respectfully and appreciating every bite. I think that's really what it comes down to is appreciating it and understanding that these uh, perfectly billeted fillets that are sitting in this sterile seafood cabinet had a whole life prior to um, them being put on your fry pan. Um, we've become so sophisticated with fish finding technology. It's so quick to go out to a good fishing spot and pull up some fish. Um, the technological brilliance of World War II translated into sonar being created that allows you to find fish. Um, and so you, you just you just want it to be a little more fair on the fish to some degree. Um, the only way to really truly understand and experience it is to put some goggles on and get underwater and really see what the uh, what the environment is like. And only till then will you really um, have a full appreciation for your fish. We kind of had this perception that the ocean is so vast and so um, abundant, kind of, which was the case 50 years ago, that we forget that it's not quite the case now. 
Now, this is an interesting idea, shifting baselines. So if you imagine the Hodaki goal 50 years ago, you could use a orange peel to catch kingfish. There was crayfish in rock pools. Um, that should be the ecological baseline. There was trevally schools the size of like a kilometre squared. Um, instead, this baseline is changing. So as, and that baseline is what, ch what changes are measured against in science. So as knowledge is lost and people have faulty memories and information is not passed down through generations, um, the baseline of what we think is really, really good slowly degrades. And so um, it translates to the magnitude of degradation to the ocean being underestimated. And we're biased and compare our current realities with what we know. So it's this lack of communicating the state of the ocean and actually spending time underwater and out there in it that means that human exploitation is allowed to continue increasing. It's a really kind of powerful concept, but quite hard to explain. <laughs> So I just want to touch on some of the amazing knowledge that I've learned from the students up north. And this is incorporating Mātauranga Māori into science and into marine management in particular. So what it does is it encapsulates a Māori worldview and involves experiencing, studying and understanding the world from an Indigenous cultural perspective. So it's not just the way that they see things, but it's the it's the reasons why um, we see them in that specific way. And a few examples of Mātauranga Māori in practice is a large rock pool called Pukitahopua, which is on the west coast of where my students are in Kaitaia. Now, it is off Whānau land, and it is a rock pool that is left bay. It's a nursery for power. So it's left bay unless there is a huge weather event or something and no one can get kai from the surrounding coastline. It's left as a nursery for crayfish, power, and kinna to resupplement the outer areas for future generations. Rahuis are another example of mātauranga in practice, um, which can be under all sorts of scenarios, algae blooms, they can be human death over fishing. It's a really, really effective means to help to slow the degradation of the environment. And there are many examples where Mātauranga and science have validated one another, like the recent Nelson flooding event. Um, local iwi placed a rahui on the ocean there for a while. And I think it was, yeah, maybe it was four weeks. And everyone respected it and it actually allowed things to settle down, especially with all of the sedimentation. Another way is utilising all parts of the fish and we can all get better at this. Now, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, a stakeholder panel meeting, and we were looking at how to best utilise 10 years of research and 73 research projects in a way to create impact. And we were asked kind of why we do it, what's our whole reason, why are we marine scientists or why there are all sorts of people in the room, commercial fishers, etc. Um, why do we do what we do? And the kind of theme that kept coming across was that we don't want to be murdered by our children in the future for allowing the ocean to become less bright, less abundant, etc. And I kind of thought that was a bloody good point. Um, and what we ended up coming up for was a slightly more civilised and meaningful way of saying not to be murdered by grandchildren, and that was tūpuna pono. So what that translates to is to be good ancestors. And for me, I just want my offsprings, offsprings, offspring to have the most brightest and fabulous experience under the ocean, and I want my students that you can see and these photos to be able to provide kaimoana um, for their families now and in the future. Um, and their relationship and their, the intensity of it with the ocean is something that is just in incredible, like this just amazing, amazing thing. Um, so 
what's really cool is we actually do have such a bright future ahead. Just the people that I meet who are involved in this area are like incredible, so passionate. Um, not only the scientists, um, but the commercial fishermen as well. They're working really, really hard, many of them, um, to do really well. So bringing Māori and Western science knowledge together really offers a way forward, um, really effective. Increasing our knowledge of cumulative effects, so instead of looking at fishing itself, um, looking at fishing in combination with ocean acidification, temperature and plastic pollution and figuring out how that's going to change things. Um, we've got such an opportunity to be global leaders here. Um, there's no reason why we can't start implementing more marine reserves, cutting our quota. There's literally no reason, but supply is determined by demand, so you all have a role to play in that. Um, yeah, and that's that. <laughs> Cool, so I've just got some um, some questions here. Let's just give this a little refresh. Uh, open Q&A. Cool. So <laughs> the first question is that it seems nuts that we still bottom trawl. Why is it still happening and allowed? So this is a really, really good question. A huge amount of our fish, as you heard, 68% is caught via bottom trawl, and it is not a futurally sustainable method of catching our fish. I think it is the cost of these other methods like sunken long line that obviously do not catch as many fish and perhaps take more effort to do so. Um, it really comes down to cost, but again, if people actually knew how their fish were being caught, I'm sure that the demand would be... Um, higher for more sustainable fishing methods. So still happening, there is large quantities of area, I think over 30% that is um, stopped from bottom trawling, so it's not allowed. But we just, my students and I just wrote in proposals the other week um, to not allow <coughs> bottom trawling off Cape Brett up in the northeast um, of where they are. So it's still happening a lot in shore, which is, a real issue and then also offshore around the sea mounts where those really unique corals and things lie. So there's no really easy answer, um, but it takes people just making bold decisions and um, yeah. Oh, perfect, there you go. Greenpeace, website, off you go. Um, here we go. What, if anything, are scientists and industry each doing respectively to try to bridge their historic mistrust and land on agreements over the current status of New Zealand fisheries? Amazing question. I was talking at the airport with a lovely man, Aaron, who runs the Deep Water Group, who um, is obviously involved in the Hokie Orange Ruffy fishery and a lot of that's caught by bottom trawling and we agree to disagree on some subjects however we just had a laugh and actually having those conversations and and just being like look we're not going to agree on anything but let's talk about it anyway um, and kind of let's not take things too seriously straight on because the relationship between scientists and guys like Aaron have historically been extremely polarizing. You're not gonna get anywhere by yelling across a boardroom and saying, stop what you're doing. He's just as interested in coming up with better techniques that are also economically feasible as well. So I think it's even just getting those sorts of people in the same room is like an achievement in itself because Historically, they don't even want to be in the same room as each other, but I don't see anything positive going forward unless we all work together and know that it's not going to be a quick process and you're not going to get exactly what you want straight away, but you might achieve something along the right direction. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers that. Um, how can I be more connected to the ocean here in Wanaka? 
Uh, <laughs> go to the coast? <laughs> um, I mean, obviously making really smart decisions. Watch some documentaries as well. Maybe not six seriously. Um, making smart decisions at the seafood counter. Um, trying to, if you can, jump on a fishing trip and with some friends and go out and see it for yourself. Like, if you can get out there and if you can get in the water, ideally on a quite calm day where it's been calm for a while that, so you can actually see more than two metres in front of you, um, and you can actually see the interaction of everything underwater. There's literally nothing better. Um, that's, I think, the best way to connect with the ocean is to jump in and see it. I always say, if I could, shout everyone in New Zealand a trip to the Poor Knights Islands to see what a functioning marine reserve looks like and just how bright and abundant it is would be life-changing to everyone. What happened to Orange Ruffy? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so when we were talking earlier a little bit about the uh, stock assessments and about how they need to determine the stock numbers, not only that, but, sh but the age of sexual maturity um, and the age distribution of a stock, they kind of assume the Orange Ruffy that lived down around like a thousand metres deep, they assumed that they acted in a similar way to inshore fish species in the sense that they uh, matured sexually quite early on, but they actually don't mature until they're around 30 and they live to over 140 years in age. Um, so they're extremely slow growing. And back before we had eco-acoustic sounders and video technology that could actually determine what species you're um, assessing really, really deep down, they just had no idea. So they made assumptions. And what that meant is that the Orange Ruffy stocks were very, very quickly overexploited, um, and they still have not recovered. So although the total allowable catch was reduced, they're still, yeah, there's some stocks which are in better shape than others. Um, and they're really cool fish as well. They used to be called slime head. They figured out that Orange Ruffy was more marketable. Um, <laughs> hi there. Where can we find more information about the New Zealand Seaweed Plan? So if you go onto Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, Google that. Um, there's a bunch of information about the New Zealand seafood stra um, seaweed strategy. And this is a really exciting area. Um, so seaweed farming will definitely be in our future, which is very cool. Um, what about guppy bags? What do you do with the tiny bits of fluff, fluff that collect? Guppy bags are cool. Um, basically what they are is a really small micron mesh bag that you put plastic clothes into. And then the idea is the microfibers accumulate in the corners. And you, what you do is you kind of flip it inside out, take the, that accumulation of microfibers and then put it in the bin. So you're not you know, getting rid of the problem, but you're stopping it from entering the wastewater treatment uh, plants that eventually make it go into the ocean in many cases. How do we help influence and improve legislation and governments of quotas? Um, yeah, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? Um, I guess pressure, demand, supply at an individual level, what you do with your wallet. Um, yes, you can still carry out those, uh, like the Greenpeace things, that sort of thing. Uh, but it is really, really hard. I guess voting, who's doing what about ocean sustainability? That's a great question for our friend Isabel Ewing, the reporter, to ask. Um, what else have we got? In Tasmania, there have been a lot of controversy regarding the environmental impact of salmon farming. Does the New Zealand farming industry have negative Im environmental impacts? Absolutely, there are 100% negative environmental impacts. Um, but it's all balanced, right? So there is the feces and the feed that goes through the, um, the nets and can accumulate down the bottom um, and that environment can become anoxic with the excess uh, nitrogen that are then chomped by the bacteria and they use all of the uh, oxygen there. So there are definitely negative impacts, but they can be moved around the farms so, and they can all be reversed as well. So. 
it's yeah there's there's negative impacts for everything if you want to get the kind of best farmed uh, species products you probably want to look at shellfish seaweed um, Farm versus freshwater salmon. Freshwater salmon is farm two. Um, in which seafoods are collected through bottom trawling? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, some of those hot ones like Gurnage, Hoki, um, Tetakihi, basically most inshore fish species can be caught by bottom trawl. So again, if you're going to go away with anything, ask how your fish was caught anywhere you go. I think that's all of the questions. Um, if anyone else does have any other questions, um, I'm sure uh, Veronica wouldn't mind staying another five <laughs> minutes. You can pop up and have a chat to her. Um, thank you very much on behalf of all of us and on behalf of WOW for coming along um, and shedding some of the light on Seaspiracy. And I really appreciate the New Zealand context because I'm sure all of you um, that have watched the film um, it does have a very global outlook. And so, yeah, beautiful to have that New Zealand story. Um, at WOW, our goal is to educate, inspire and engage uh, people in the conversation of sustainability. And you've really embodied that for us today. So uh, a huge thank you. And if everyone could give another last round of applause. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Hopefully you learned a thing or two. And don't forget to fill out the Summit Post event survey to win a voucher. <laughs>